in this episode we ask, can radicalized kids recover? Based on my experience and, and homeland security, especially since 9-11 was such a shock to the system, it created not only fear to those on the outside, but it also created fear of those who lived amongst us. Our feelings are all part of this giant uncontrolled experiment. To act in ways that are violent, for the protection of others. This directive positions the internet as a tool for corporations and profit to be able to do far more with their own stories and their own narratives in the online space. That was clearly meant to go online to certain kinds of people to affect social change. They can say very dehumanizing things. They can launch harassment campaigns. And so these are campaigns that are designed to look like they're bottom up. To sustain private capitalist and what that allows are is people that we know things about hey guys we're confident are not uh the various actors uh to get in a faster line the united states government can be a leader by giving the kind of money to the ideological war that is needed and we all created a protracted war on terror was built upon programs like government and surveillance the nsa took another unusual step recently making one of its own software programs available to the public for free. So finding out who hacked you, these are hard to do. Were the hackers compromising and what were they, they trying to do there? I'm not sure that we know entirely what they were trying to do. More importantly, there's, there are, there's a lot of the election infrastructure, of course, that is connected to the internet. And you have our nation's critical infrastructure, our utilities, our banking, uh, our water system. We know that terrorist organizations are skilling up with cyber offensive capability and of course here we have content that's being manufactured by users disseminate the information to wikileaks and elsewhere and that is very sophisticated but what's happening now is artificial intelligence is coming through the resourcing and the agency that has been put in place and the role each of us plays in creating the online ecosystem where hate can thrive and it doesn't just come from technology companies it comes from everything that we see around us because people are collecting and the algorithms are becoming smarter based on the fact that we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the attacks of 9-11 one data point that connected young muslims who grew up post 9-11 the cyber equivalent of 9-11 what would that look like? On the internet, broadcast on the internet, um, linked to, you know, on various message boards. Like in the way in which people are absorbing their religion by spreading. That there's an inevitableist propaganda that has been fed to us. Saying, uh, not even insinuating, but actually saying that those people who support Israel have an allegiance to another. Global architecture of behavior modification. That take young kids and teach them. He was 13 years old. Then AI or artificial intelligence has entered in as well. And what this has done is made them take hold of the digital media. And connecting them when people are doing searches. To take down, you know, and not allow certain types of content. I just wanted to put my, my two cents in. They have put some money into the ideological components of this war to give them credit. Not necessarily an act of aggression, it's just normal espionage. Part one. A call to arms. What do you think our adversaries think right now? If you do a cyber attack on America, what's going to happen to them? So basically, uh, I would say right now, they do not think that much will happen to them. They don't fear us. They don't fear us. In this atmosphere, sadly, like until these platforms clean themselves up, um, we as journalists have a sort of a tactical obligation to the notion of uh, a Jewish conspiracy, a Jewish dual loyalties, and um, anti-Semitism the same all over the world, I imagine. People who react like that to their country's conspiracies, turning them into tales that are told like children's fables and also into a place in the memory or the imagination, a place we go to as tourists to revive nostalgia or try to find something we've lost. That they have to push away hundreds of years of their own history and heritage and absorb something brand new. And that makes them vulnerable to things like Russian disinformation efforts where they not, may not even realize the origin of it. It's not like they, like Russia came to them and said, hey, vote this way. Somebody on their Facebook page, probably someone they went to high school with and, and has started some kind of conspiracy theories itself or has, been, has read something that Russia started and has now passed that along and it's in your brain in a way that you're not even, it's not that you're, 
you've been brainwashed into the system so that when people go looking for it, they're not just seeing the garbage. So you see a change from keeping everything classified, not talking about anything, to trying to share a little bit more information. And the reason is a belief that... What we would imagine to be an equal playing field, but it's really not. We've spent a lot of time now online and built a lot of our own networks, and some people have... And this influence over what you see online, who you see, and how you see them. But with just two clicks, we can alert the newsfeed algorithm and say... Much of the communication out there that we don't like, hate speech that we're not particularly crazy about, the abstract threat that... Has perpetuated this violence against us. And we were just throwing everything at the wall because we were freaked out and we didn't know where the next attack was going to come from. It was September 11, 2001. Asana used social media to call for attacks on Americans and burned her U.S. passport. According to the Times, Masana, the daughter of immigrants from Yemen, now says she regrets her mistake in return for his participation and cooperation. Uh, besides his participation in this program. That seems to be a difficult judgment call whether you send somebody to prison or into a program that might allow them to help de-radicalize others. Absolutely, and I think that we have to understand that the, the nonprofit organizations around the world that are doing the meat of this work, they need support. They need financial support by philanthropists. They need curated understanding of behavioral uh, information that companies of all kinds have, not just the technology company. But we really need to be thinking about what converts somebody from being a troll or... Most notably in recent times, the Taliban. And often, most of these predictive technologies, that's what they're looking for. And so they follow a set of steps that's called an algorithm. Those algorithms that we use to sell you genes can be used to actually bring new ideas forward. So algorithms are essentially a series of steps that, that maybe will lead them even further astray. And that becomes part of the predictive model about who will be successful in the future. The most powerful predictions of human behavior come from actually intervening in our behavior. Now that we know that your environment has such a profound effect on your biology, this would suggest that we are prone to constant change based on our environment. Or, or, or if we understand these processes, tap into these processes, we can be ruler over our genes. When you look at the space that free will has been getting crammed into more and more so with each passing year of insights into the biology behavior, I gotta say, it's gonna get really, really crammed in or non-existent. The aim of the punishment should be the reintegration of these children. With us, with this amazing, what we call plasticity on one hand, and fixed characters on other hand. And they would make the men feel less manly. It goads them to participate. So it was a fantastic way to manipulate the adults. No, no, you're absolutely right. So on one hand, uh, we have an old genome, right? It's uh, millions of years old, that's fixed. On the other hand, we have a changing world that is talking to our DNA. And with details, it can only be obtained by hacking their computers. That kind of knowledge, why you do something, how you lean in a particular direction and you want that thing as opposed to the other thing. An inclination for people to believe what they want to believe. With massive platforms uh, and yeah, social media companies, that frankly look the other way. Especially because the main advice they have on technology is from the technology companies themselves. And that's the amazing paradox and challenge. In this time where fake news are having such an impact. The challenge is to understand the biology of the context of our behaviors. Deployed in such a way that young kids are thinking about themselves different. They were having a crisis of identity. By the end of the process, it was the child who was doing the execution. These are some of the kinds of um, disparate harms. Kind of brute force attack against um, the, the guts of the voting machine. Something where it's quite simple, like when you sign up for this, uh, here in, in basic English is, is how your is how your data is how your data uh, might be used. So at a very basic level, um, we try and take a really very vast quantity of demographic consumer lifestyle data. Which is also targeted, so then it becomes much more powerful and these are the kinds of things we can't consent to. And they were creating psychographic, what they called the profiles of, of every voter. And we blend that with uh, psychographic um, uh, data, which is a modeling of personality. Mm -hmm. vis vis harvesting Facebook profiles. Facebook itself is this big surveillance machine and they're talking about privacy without talking about what they do. To start to um, 
to be able to target. So not only target ads at their phones while they're there, but then you can track and follow them home. Surveillance so capitalism doesn't stop at Facebook. For the people that are trying to recruit, whether it's a female, whether it's a male, how old that person is, they know what they're doing, which is, you know, looking at what people are talking about online, whether political positions or... Touching our behavior to nudge, to influence, to tune, to herd our behavior. They're also making life and death decisions for us. In courtrooms in the U.S., algorithms are guiding judges toward its commercial outcome. And they dealt with it. They trained machine learning and they used moderation to become desensitized over a period of time as opposed to finding what the bad guys are doing. Because there's no legal issue here. I mean, we can epigenetic atrophy reverse the movie by removing an actor and setting up a new narrative. So their narrative, you help people understand the pain they're going through and why this type of ideology can't be allowed to continue. Take away their platforms. It's not free speech, it's terrorism. Yes, and it needs to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Part of, part of the difficulty, I would say, in looking at these cases is it's very hard to determine whether an individual is disillusioned. The American public needs to understand that the role of an us versus them ideology the role that tech companies play in regulating or banning fringe users means that really only the very largest companies are able to avail themselves fully of that marketplace for its production processes that create these prediction products which is what they sell and how they make money sort of like a, a lifestyle brand and how they dress how they eat what they think about what they listen to but the other thing that i think is really important about our approach is that we want to be very transparent these kinds of messages that are playing into here come in in a very strong way mass testing and messaging to get that you know and you combine that with targeting and you, you try thousands of different adverts on different people people who know what brand of shoes Jackie was wearing on the day of the crime. People who can recite whole sentences from the Warren Report. Portable people meter, and it listens for a little silent signal encoded in every TV program, so it can know uh, what they watch on TV, who your social media friends are, where you go. You know, you ultimately could be extremely well targeted. People want to know, yeah. can you just turn your phone off and be mute? So, so, so I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a technologist. I, I, think as, I think as long as the campaign isn't the NSA, if your phone's off, you're, you're, probably, you're probably good, because it's literally listening to everything you're saying. But, but the, first, the first part of this question raised a really interesting point, which is, are phones, are these algorithms listening to us? Are they eavesdropping on us? Sure, there are algorithms. So in fact, all of this was pre-wired, like the script was pre-written. It's not just a script. DNA is a dynamic movie. Okay, this is technology that domestic campaigns are using to track you, to follow you, to learn all about you, to send you targeted political ads. And communicate with people. Your phone and TV are tracking you and political campaigns are listening in. Thinking about other techniques that are used by digital listening, like for example, cultural listening and social listening is something that these companies know how to do. Our experiences are being written into that movie, a dynamic movie focuses on de-radicalizing other people. That and it's complicated because you have a lot of federal agencies who have some responsibility for cybersecurity and you have the private sector. As scary as it is at times, um, it, it is the First Amendment world that we live in. And, and therefore our view of the world uh, changes to the extent that the, the world we see is more like the world we want to see, even if it isn't really the world the world as it is. But in a world where hundreds of threats or more are lurking around every corner, how do we make sure we're focusing on the right ones at the right time? Again, there's another problem of amplification where we have to really um, reward people for good behavior, right? We want any hope of uh, reformation and, and really take an overall uh, approach to this. Holistic interventions and yes, medication when necessary. They found a solution that didn't exist before a couple days ago. It proves, and YouTube did this a couple days ago as well when they had a problem with child pornography. Which is to say that things that are local are now global by virtue of being put online. Online aspect of fomenting this hate. The vast majority of folks engaging in this kind of activity are, are absolutely uh, behaving within the, within the confines of, of the law. There are ways to do this and there are ways to, to keep some of this content on the platform without amplifying anymore. Now this appalling incident tells us a lot about online extremism. This, in my opinion, was you know, one of the first evidence that in humans too, an experience can result in long-term changes to the way genes are programmed. That they've rejected the ideology 
or whether they've rejected their group or whether they're simply putting on a face to avoid criminal punishment. Like they, they make choices all the time. And I'll just note that several years ago, there was an attempt across the social media industry to deal with the spread of ISIS propaganda. And also fake news. Are... It's very similar to the propaganda being used right now because bigotry is very unoriginal. Following all of these dark sites on social media. And other people have to go to these very extreme lengths that push forward an us versus them a way of thinking in order to be heard and to be seen online. And we're chipping away at it, but if it wasn't for AI, we wouldn't have been able to bring all this data together to, to fashion. Algorithms, all these things algorithms to like try to detect these kinds of videos, but there's, there's just so half the, the human uh, uh, amount of people. Capacity, but the sensors, the facial recognition, the smart dishwasher, the smart television set, the smart car, the smart city, all of this digital infrastructure now. That it picks up the digital IDs of everybody who is in the room or inside the down room right. that fits. The behavioral data that we have on how humans live their lives. Biology all the way down. We can reverse the effects of stress hormones if we detect it earlier. And those things will change their biology. It turns out this is exactly where the science comes in. Which is basically you know, if there is a, a big news event that millions of people are looking for information on, the propaganda against Jews, pre-Holocaust. That kind of knowledge can help us understand when young people are having a crisis of identity. And they go to their search engine or to YouTube or to Facebook, and they're actively searching out information. Almost all of the matches are driven by algorithmic recommendations. Then there's this sort of void where the, the only content that will show up in the search results is the stuff that is, you know, celebrating this or is politically motivated or is slanted um, or is untrustworthy somehow. You can remove an actor and add an actor. Like you go to data broker and say, I want to target everybody who was in this room and I want to keep sending them ads and I want to target them this way or I want to target everyone who's in this room who is under 35 and they'll know that or everyone in this room who uh, may live in a certain geographic area. What schools did they go to? What neighborhoods were they from? What zip codes do they live in? You start to take in a whole lot of data, a lot of things, but it begins with being evidence-based and data-driven and having good intelligence to work from. Are you saying that all the data that tech companies are gathering that makes people feel really uncomfortable and disturbed, do you feel that data could be turned into a force for good? You believe anything. You want to believe it. You want to believe it. Maybe you don't have a unique identification number of your, your smartphone, and you're going around to all these places. When you go home and your smartphone connects, if you have Wi-Fi at home, connects to your Wi-Fi there, does that give the campaign access to all the other devices in your house, too? It seems to, yeah. To really have a cybersecurity regime, we're going to need to unite the public and the private sectors. They're resisting being called media companies. They're resisting the um, classification as a broadcast company. So they can afford the lawyers, uh, the developers, and so on to ensure that they are fully in compliance. In uh, private sector hands, and so, so they are, in fact, having a huge impact on the choices we make. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior. All these problems of AI, now they're starting to use AI to deconstruct, to prevent the bias from being input. One of the most important things that we can do is early detection. But we can't debate historical facts. You know, the genocide of the Jews is a historical fact. There's no opinion about it. There are those communications across the line and the people who make them, I think, should be and have them prosecuted. I mean, that's not something you debate, you shut it down. Facebook really committed to taking these videos down. We're taken by surveillance capitalism as a way to nudge and tune and herd our behavior toward its guaranteed outcomes. Rather than try to stamp out bad behavior. So if there's no good, true, authoritative information out there, we think this particular message is false or fake. False, 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 and fake news are being used again this year. This person who's in the headline not from Alabama is a woman, I imagine. The most authentic voices to stop a young person are those people who have already been there and have come back. But also come to people who are vulnerable and cannot control the ways in which they're represented. It's called how safe are we? Homeland Security since 9-11. The NSA took another unusual step recently. 
making one of its own software programs available to the public for free. From legitimate uh, news outlets. I'm telling um, lies, it was fake news. With the DNA, with your remote control. All of the devices, beginning with our phones and our laptops. And if we're thinking about the voting machines themselves, either the electronic ones or the scanners, that's actually, the answer to that question is actually quite, um, quite controversial. The weakness that's imported into the system, the intelligence agencies might lose control of it. Because these machines are generally not connected to the internet, that we don't have to worry about um, uh, problems with them and potentially somebody reaching them in various ways. A decently competent computer science student can open up the machine and do things to it. You might get into the hands of criminals or state-sponsored hackers or any other foreign adversary for that, for that matter. And then be used against the population. And this is when ISIS was in their heyday. The new way of doing it, the much faster, much more powerful way. Those pilot po policies are actually surveillance policies. Force for good. <laughs> Thank you.